the open ocean seems a bleak, empty place. Its blue water is patrolled only rarely by lone hunters like this marlin. But in places, barren rocks break the surface, the peaks of massive underwater mountains rising abruptly from the seabed. At first glance, they also seem lifeless and deserted. But beneath the surface, steep slopes teem with countless species of marine animals. Anyone diving here descends into a virtually unexplored mountain world an oasis in the midst of a watery wasteland. An El Dorado for biologists. And a final refuge for many of the large marine species that long ago disappeared elsewhere, victims of overfishing and pollution. But what is the magical attraction for these animals? Are these places really the paradise that dive operators claim? To find out, scientists from all over the world descend to the depths of the sea mounts. The first expedition heads out into the Pacific. Around 350 kilometers off the coast of Mexico, a long extinct volcano rises 30 meters out of the water. Roca Partida, Broken Rock, is the smallest of the Mexican Revilla Hijedo Islands. To reach it, the international team of scientists spend more than 24 hours traveling on the expedition ship Solmar 5. Dive tourists are also on board. The money they pay helps finance the expensive trip. An onboard compressor ensures an adequate supply of full tanks, and a crew of 10 ensure the well-being and safety of the guests. Roca Patida is just one of around 100,000 marine mountains rising more than 1,000 meters from the seabed. Most are entirely underwater. Many are virtually unknown. Here, though, Mexican marine biologist Zapata Lopez knows that the rock sometimes attracts exceptionally large numbers of fish. Roca Partida is a very unique place because it's geog geographical position. So the north and south part of the rock are basically walls in angle like this. So when the water, the current hits the north and south part of the rock, it brings all the rich nutrients to the surface, feeding a lot of the small fish. And because of that fish and the plankton, we have the big feeders around the rock like whale sharks. So big fish attracts a bigger fish and other type of fishes, and those as well attract sharks. So that's why it is a unique place also for divers. When a current encounters an obstacle, such as a wall of rock, the water is forced upwards. It also creates turbulence at the top. That traps plankton, tiny crustaceans and microorganisms carried by the current, and thus presents an abundance of food for many species of fish. The sea around Roca Partida is far too restless for the Solmar to moor there. So the inflatable is launched to ferry the colorful mix of divers to the rock. The boat attracts bottlenose dolphins. Hard to say who is more intrigued, divers or dolphins. The swollen part of a dolphin's head, its melon, is used to send ultrasonic pulses that enable it, like a bat, to detect prey by echolocation. 
The sheer walls of Roca Partida descend nearly 100 meters. The volcano itself rises from a depth of 2,000 meters. At shallower depths especially, biodiversity exceeds all expectations. Schools of tuna this size are now rarely found anywhere else. Almost without being noticed, 90% of all large fish have disappeared from the oceans. Ten years ago, that was also the case here. Today, schools of snapper are so dense that they hide the rock behind them. Rock that offers not only food, but also refuge. Hiding places are few and far between in the open ocean. One of the scientists has made a discovery. White tip reef sharks. A few decades ago, they were found throughout the Indo-Pacific, but commercial shark fishing has decimated their numbers. They are actually typical inhabitants of tropical coral reefs. But Roca Partida offers everything these nocturnal hunters need, prey in abundance and niches where they can rest during the day. By opening and closing their mouth, the sharks pump water over their gills. This active breathing allows them to remain stationary and rest till the night's hunt begins. unlike the Galapagos shark, which can pose a threat to a reef shark. These predators need to keep moving to get enough water through their gills. They can't lie on the seabed and rest. Despite their name, Galapagos sharks are found in tropical and subtropical waters all over the world. Eyeball to eyeball with a Galapagos shark, a potentially dangerous encounter for a diver. The three meter long hunters have an aggressive reputation. There are many recorded cases of attacks. But this is the biggest visitor by far, and also one of the most harmless. A whale shark. The biggest fish in the world feeds by filtering tiny plankton out of the water and presents no danger for divers. But its sheer size means that the peaceful giant is an awe-inspiring sight. Many whale sharks reach a weight of 10 tons and a length of 13 meters. Oceanic oases like Roca Partida are important resting places for these long-range migrants. In 1994, the entire group of islands became a protected zone and has since then been more rigorously policed with noticeable results. The scientists are pleased with their stock take. On board a surprise, the humpback whales have arrived. They are regular visitors to the volcanic islands between March and May, so dependable that they're incorporated in dive safari programs. These are mothers and calves stopping off on their annual migration north. A good place to listen to whales. Humpback whales have long been famous for their songs, but it's only the males that sing, and only in the mating period. A mother talks to her calf in soothing low-frequency tones. The sounds are just perceptible, but the repertoire extends well into the infrasonic range. A calf will stay with its mother for up to a year and follow her for thousands of kilometers from its birthplace near the equator to the food-rich Arctic Ocean, where the animals spend the summer. 
But the crew are anxious to move on. They've promised a spectacle that will trump everything that's been seen so far. The Solmar 5 sets course for San Benedicto. The two volcanic islands of the Revilla Higedo group are about 100 kilometers apart. The journey takes nine hours. When the volcano last erupted in 1952, it virtually stripped the island of vegetation. But the captain knows that the slopes under the water teem with life. Experience has taught him where to drop anchor among the treacherous rocks. But before the team set off to dive, one of the biologists spots something on the water. Frigate birds, graceful fish hunters that pluck their prey directly out of the water. There must be something happening under the water to attract such a large flock. And there certainly is. The divers are instantly surrounded by hundreds of sardines. They can hardly keep the agitated fish at arm's length. The sardines see the divers as a protective shield. But no one can hide them from these hunters. Tuna are among the best swimmers in the ocean. When they turn up, the only safety is in numbers. The swarm is a collection of egoists, each one trying to save its own skin. And at times, the tuna can't see the fish for the school. Any sardine that gets separated is lost. So perfect choreography is in everyone's interest. But swarms have one drawback. they attract more predators. A whole school of sailfish. Masters of the ocean and the world's fastest swimmers. Record breakers reaching speeds up to 110 kilometers an hour. Raising their dorsal fins like sails, they herd the frightened sardines back and forth until the small fish are totally disoriented. Then they move like lightning, slashing at victims in the school with their sword, their elongated snout. More and more sailfish encircle the prey. If one misses a fish, the next one catches it. The coordination is perfect. Few people have seen sailfish at such close quarters. Even fewer have been able to film them. The scientists return to the surface with reluctance. On the Solmar, the recreational divers now get ready for the highlight they were promised. Some joined this tour solely for what they are now going to experience. For marine biologists, every pod of killer whales is a pleasing sign that marine life is recovering. But the stars of the upcoming show are mantas. Every time I go into the water with the mantas here is a real thrill. They're the biggest in the world and the friendliest as well. By friendly, I mean that wherever you go, the mantas will follow. And that doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. No sooner are the divers in the water than the first of the gentle giants swoops over them. With a span of six to seven meters, these rays dwarf every other member of the family. To avoid injury to their skin, they should not be touched. Easier said than done, the mantas themselves seem to seek close contact.
Like many large oceanic species, giant mantas feed on plankton, which they filter out of the water. As at Roca Partida, the current here carries the small organisms up from the deep, straight into the open mouths of the rays. But what mainly attracts the mantas to San Benedicto are these clarion angelfish. Normally, they graze the algae on the rocks, but as soon as a giant manta approaches, they flock to it as one. They become cleaner fish, removing parasites from the visitor. Even if they sometimes nip, the symbiotic relationship clearly benefits both sides. The manta gets rid of its tormentors and the angelfish get a good meal. Whether the remora on the ray's neck also pay for the ride with body care is something scientists have yet to agree on. The hitchhikers attach themselves to their host by means of a modified fin. The biologists can recognize many mantas by their underside markings. More than a hundred have already been catalogued here. What age mantas reach, where they migrate to, how many of them there are, these are all questions that the researchers hope to answer in time. San Benedicto is an ideal place for that. The giant mantas seem to like the feel of the air bubbles. Perhaps it reminds them of the body care provided by the cleaner fish. What makes the flying giant so friendly towards divers at San Benedicto is likely to remain a mystery forever. These pictures show more than any words what fascinating encounters can occur between animals and human beings, just as in the times when fishing and hunting were engaged in only for food. The scientists have seen for themselves that the Mexican government's strict protection and policing of Revilla Hijedo have had the desired result. But what about other diving paradises? The Maldive Islands in the Indian Ocean are a particularly popular destination. The island state consists of well over a thousand coral islands grouped in 26 atolls. At one time, volcanoes rose out of the sea here and coral reefs formed on their flanks. The mountains subsided, the reefs stayed behind. In 2008, news spread that up to 200 reef mantas gather in Hanifaru Bay in Ba Atoll during the monsoon season. Since then, the small bay has also attracted innumerable safari ships. On this trip, the captain also has local marine biologists on board. They monitor and plan the dives. We are going to do our dives on Hanifaru Bay. Hanifaru Bay is a very shallow lagoon, inside coming 16, 18 meters, and there is two rocks, coral head, like cleaning station. And these mantas are approaching on this cleaning station. In the middle of the year, these plankton from uh, inside Baetol, from these sandy bottoms, when outflow current comes, these plankton come a lot. And these plankton are coming inside of this honey bay. 
because this landmark is something remarkable. That's why I think Sape thinks it's coming inside. More planktons. The plankton attracts the mantas and the mantas the tourists. Apart from the safari boats, there are also day trippers from the Bar Atoll dive bases. During the monsoon, there's almost a constant stream of snorkelers and divers entering the water. Reaching around four meters in width, reef mantas are smaller than their oceanic relatives and very maneuverable. The ray deftly eludes the many divers. But the throng means stress for the animals. Like their bigger cousins, they filter feed as they glide through the water, moving slowly and steadily to conserve energy. But here they are constantly confronted with obstacles, which takes a toll. In recent years, the number of mantas in the bay has dropped dramatically. Today, the gathering is only a quarter the size it once was. The rays that come here roam the world's oceans. How they know when Hanifaru becomes ripe for a feast is a mystery. A plankton bloom occurs when the tidal wave caused by the moon in late summer collides with the southwest monsoon current. The result is a maelstrom that carries small crustaceans and other tiny creatures from the deep into shallower water and forces them into Hanifaru Bay. Marine biologists regularly check the plankton content of the water. Only by comparing plankton levels and numbers of mantas with data collected in the past can they say for sure what changes have occurred. The water is a lot cloudier than a few hours ago. Microscopic examination reveals a collection of typical planktonic species, diatoms, rotifers, and villagers, all less than a millimeter long. Seeking refuge, they migrate to deeper water in the morning, where they then cannot be washed out to sea. As a result, they become concentrated in the bay and transform it into a paradise for divers. Underwater, there are significantly more mantas than the day before. Cleverly, they fly in a staggered formation, so plankton that is not picked up by the first manta flows straight into the mouth of the next. The bay is barely the size of a soccer pitch, but the 50 or so mantas share it with a whale shark. He lives in all tropical and subtropical oceans and is also drawn here by the plankton. Whale sharks and mantas both filter their food out of the water. But the rays swim through the plankton soup with their mouths open all the time. The giant shark opens and closes its mouth and thus actively sucks in water and forces it over its gills at a rate of up to 6,000 liters an hour. But marine biologists see clear evidence of one thing. Because of all the divers, the mantas are often unable to spread out in proper feeding formations. Since this film was made, the Maldive government has ruled that only snorkeling should be permitted here. So biologists hope that these fascinating rays will soon start returning again in larger numbers. Oceanic oases like Bar Atoll are relatively small, but there are underwater mountain ranges of much greater dimensions. 
When tectonic plates move, they can push up entire mountain massifs. What's more, the Earth's crust often cracks due to the friction. Magma escapes, cools, and grows along the seams. Long chains of underwater volcanoes have been created in this way. One such chain, 300 kilometers long, is in the Pacific off the coast of Colombia. Only one peak breaks the surface, Malpelo Island. No more than a handful of vessels a year are allowed to enter the protected waters around it. Even the shortest route from the mainland due south from Panama is a long 500 kilometers. Again, the trip is shared by scientists and recreational divers, a practice now common all over the world. But the number of persons on board must not exceed 25. That's the legal limit. After a night and a day traveling, the ship finally reaches Malpelo, a barren outcrop of rock that's anything but an idyllic tropical paradise. 300 meter high walls of rock soar almost vertically into the air. There are no protected anchorages and the currents are strong. Dives need to be carefully planned and monitored. Conditions can change dramatically at any time. It always takes time for everyone to get their gear together and make sure everything's working. Each person can easily be carrying an extra 30 kilos. Only the scientists are allowed to accompany the guide on the first exploratory dive. Those in the small dinghy find that the waves are not quite as harmless as they looked from the mother ship. Underwater, it's immediately clear why Malpelo has been declared a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Thousands of snappers. The divers have never seen schools this big. Like most fish, they tend to stay at fairly shallow depths. The island is exposed to eight different currents, depending on the season. The Humboldt Current, for example, brings cool, oxygen-rich water from the Antarctic. The dive team wants to check the shark population. Worldwide, 100,000 sharks a year are hunted or die as bycatch in fishing nets. More than 100 species are already considered endangered. Cracking and rubbing a plastic bottle, a time-honored way to attract sharks, the sounds resemble those made by a shark feeding. A Galapagos shark. Fortunately, it realizes in time that the guide is not in its prey spectrum. But then every deception is forgotten at the sight of a magnificent natural spectacle. The divers are suddenly surrounded by hundreds of bizarre, fabulous creatures, scalloped hammerheads. It's only recently that scientists discovered what brings these long-range migrants to these waters. They take their bearings from underwater mountains, which cause changes in the Earth's magnetic field that the hammerheads can use for guidance. Back on board, the divers unwind after the exciting encounters. Diving is not only tiring, it also works up an appetite. 
but the crew is well prepared and able to meet all culinary requirements. During the meal, the guide prepares the recreational divers for their excursion, which includes pointing out the rules that need to be observed. Soldiers stationed on the island keep the area under surveillance and protect it from illegal shark catchers and uncontrolled diving tourism. A gathering of birds out at sea, an unmistakable sign of schooling fish. To protect themselves from bird attack, the jacks form what divers call a bait ball, which invariably attracts other predators. The swarm attracts the attention of a whole armada of silky sharks. These hunters locate their prey with the help of a special system of sense organs on the side of their body, a system that responds to the swimming movements of nearby fish. The frightened jacks seem to dart in all directions, but researchers have now found that some swarm members are always faster than the rest and thus influence the swarm more than others. But the sharks have a counter strategy and even cooperate with tuna. Working together like sheepdogs, they herd the panicking fish into a denser ball. Then they plunge into the swarm and separate their prey. By cooperating like this, each predator gets far more to eat than a lone hunter in the open sea. So in oceanic oases, the pickings are not only better just because of the numbers of fish, As mass rendezvous points, they also offer far more valuable opportunities for cooperating with others. So places like this are even more important for threatened species. The next oceanic oasis is almost unknown and far more dangerous than many others. It's more than 500 kilometers off the Pacific coast of Costa Rica, not far from the tip of the volcano that forms Cocos Island. Cocos is the island that inspired Robert Louis Stevenson's classic novel, Treasure Island. Because according to legend, there's pirate gold here waiting to be discovered. To keep the island safe from treasure hunters, it's been protected for more than 30 years. But its real treasure is well hidden away, deep underwater. All the other volcanoes of the thousand kilometer long Cocos Ridge are well below the surface. To explore them, the expedition ship has a modern submersible on board. It's piloted by Smulik Bloom from Israel. All my life as a scuba diver, I always wanted to know what's behind the corner and wh what's down there. So I did trimix diving and I went down to 100 meter and I tried to see what's there. And when I got there, I wanted to see what's down there. So this machine takes me there to see what's there. And everything that we see in deeper water, deeper than, than 50 meter, is uh, mostly new for us. The seven-ton deep sea requires a crane to lift it into the water. The practice hands of a whole team of specialists get the submarine ready for its mission. Since 2006, research teams have been using the deep sea to explore the geology and biodiversity of the Cocos Ridge. It provides access to a world of highly explosive geology. Earthquakes and devastating tsunamis could occur at any time. The underwater mountains to which Smulik and a German shark specialist are about to descend sit right on the seam of two tectonic plates, 
the Cocos Plate, moving at seven centimeters a year, is pushing under the Caribbean Plate at a geologically breathtaking pace, and that causes a lot of stresses and strains. The tow line is released. Now the crew's only link with the rest of the world is by radio. Descending at a speed of 10 meters a minute, the deep sea dives into the seemingly endless depths of the ocean. The submersible is just one and a half meters in diameter. Its air supply lasts no longer than six hours. At a depth of 26 meters, the two men encounter a magnificent whale shark. It's around 10 meters from snout to tail. What the giant knows by instinct is that currents here carry copious amounts of deep sea plankton up to the daylight zones where he lives. Smulik Bloom discovers the reason for that 70 meters down, the peak of a submarine mountain. Even if they are hundreds of meters below the surface, seafloor structures like this still influence the nutrient content of the upper water layers. But the rock itself also offers food and refuge in the otherwise featureless world of the deep sea ocean. A whole group of moray eels find shelter in a cleft in the rock. There's such an abundance of crustaceans, sponges, fish, and other fauna here that the scientists hardly know where to look first. They discover new species on nearly every expedition. Oh, here are the dolphins. A pod of dolphins. What attracts these graceful sea mammals here becomes clear a few meters farther down. Enormous schools of fish. Because of its vast size, the chain of volcanoes also impacts massively on marine life. <laughs> Despite the fascinating spectacle, the biologist wants to go deeper. The main purpose of this dive is to find a rare deep sea shark that has virtually never been observed for any length of time. At 90 meters, as if from nowhere, a small-toothed sand tiger glides into view. Not the shark the men are looking for, but one they are nevertheless pleased to see, because this harmless shark is on the list of threatened species hunted for its fins. At 200 meters, the deep sea enters the twilight zone, the layer of deep ocean that separates the sunlit zone from pitch darkness these depths are virtually unexplored. Biodiversity has significantly decreased. Only specialists can cope with the pressure and the darkness. At 240 meters, a rare jelly nose fish is caught in the beam of the lights. Although it's classed as a bony fish, its skeleton, like that of a shark, consists mainly of cartilage. The farther the deep sea descends, the more bizarre the life forms. Angler fishes are typical deep sea species. Their large, distensible jaw enables them to swallow prey bigger than themselves. Like nocturnal birds, two mobula fly past, close relatives of manta rays. This is about as far as the deep sea can go. But just as the men are about to turn back, they spot him. A prickly shark, the deep sea recluse that this expedition was all about.
Very little is known about this creature. What is known is that it migrates between zones. It's been seen at depths ranging from 10 to 500 meters. As if to prove that, the four meter long shark dives deeper into the inaccessible darkness. It will take many more expeditions to find out more about this mysterious hunter. Time to return to the surface. Smulik regulates air in the ballast tanks so that the deep sea doesn't ascend too quickly. After hours of deep darkness, dusk seems dazzlingly bright. But as always in the tropics, it doesn't last long. As a final highlight, a night dive is planned, a special challenge in the waters around Cocos Island. In the plankton-rich water, the beam of a dive light penetrates only a few meters, and the divers need to be ever alert for dangerous encounters, because after sunset, the reef becomes the stage for a very special spectacle. Hundreds of white-tip reef sharks gather to go hunting. They present no threat to divers, but they can attract bigger, more dangerous sharks. No cleft, no cave is safe from these agile nocturnal predators. The only safety lies in remaining motionless. The slightest movement is fatal. The noise of a strike immediately draws other sharks. Amazingly, the trumpet fish goes unnoticed. He's not exposed by the light because the sharks don't hunt by sight. They detect a fish's electrical field. A big eye is not so lucky. In the frenzied scrum, everyone fights for a morsel. Nowhere in the world has such a large community of reef sharks. The conditions here are perfect for them. Lots of prey, protection from shark catchers, and a relatively warm current. As soon as the first rays of sunlight penetrate the water, the tired night hunters withdraw and diurnal fish dominate the scene. Every species has a role to play in the fascinating net of life. Marine exploitation has torn many holes in that net, and it becomes increasingly difficult to mend them. But thanks to systematic protection, that has been achieved in some places, in unique oceanic oases like this. <laughs> <laughs> 